Have I mentioned so far that this is a long chapter? Like, really long? 40 pages as opposed to 20 or 30 pages from the other rules? Basically, what I'm getting at is that part 3 for this rule won't be the last part. Happy New Year! Welcome back to the channel! It's a new year, so hi! If you're new here, I'm Cass. Again, duh. But I have a Cognitive Psychology PhD, and this series has been me going through the 12 Rules for Life from a Cognitive Science perspective. We are still in Rule 7. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. It cannot be said that I'm being expedient here. What's been said so far in this rule? Work equals sacrifice. Lots of Bible stuff about Jesus. That the best sacrifice you can make is yourself or your children. And that Socrates sacrificed himself and he wasn't even Jesus. Quick refresher of the Peterson video style guide. Straight Peterson. My reactions and responses to Peterson. And this is for when we get into some science stuff. Last little bit of business before getting back on the Peterson fun train. Like if you enjoy this video, subscribe for more of this stuff, or other cog psych related stuff, or other other stuff. Participate in the comment conversation if something strikes your fancy. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, Discord, and Patreon. Patreon will get you exclusive stuff, like fun cat videos, outtakes, or monthly live streams. Links for everything are in the description box. On with the pain! We are back to being reminded that life is suffering. The tragedy of self-conscious being produces suffering. Inevitable suffering. That suffering in turn motivates the desire for selfish, immediate gratification. For expediency. But sacrifice and work serves far more effectively than short-term, impulsive pleasure at keeping suffering at bay. Is an implication of this that animals can't suffer? He's previously argued that animals lack the capacity for self-conscious being with a capital B, so maybe Peterson's the one person alive who can watch a Sarah McLachlan ASPCA commercial without being emotionally messed with? Also, it's Nice, that suffering is inevitable, like life's default setting is suffering. But if you recall the glass houses rule, Peterson discussed the ancient Jews viewing God, and therefore creation, as being good by default. So when things were not good, it was assumed to be their fault. The whole insane responsibility idea. It seems at odds with life being suffering. Although, I guess the argument would be that we've been cast out of Eden, so... But tragedy, defined, or should I say conceived, as the arbitrary harshness of society and nature set against the vulnerability of the individual, is not the only sufferer-inducer in town. Nope. There's also evil. Specifically how awful we can be to each other. And somehow work as sacrifice needs to counter this tragedy and evil. Just when you think we're clear of it, Surprise! Adam and Eve. Again. Consider, once again, the story of Adam and Eve. Life becomes very hard for their children. That's us. After the fall and awakening of our archetypal parents. First is the terrible fate awaiting us in the post-paradisal world. In the world of history. I included this quote because... Huh? You can come really close to filling out a Peterson bingo card with these three sentences. You've got your Bible reference, Jung reference, and some stuff that makes me question how literally Peterson's reading the Bible. Peterson contends that we work because we can see the future, and because we can sort of see the future, we need to prepare for it. Sacrifice today for a secure tomorrow. Yeah, okay, sure. If you wanted to find sacrifices including the types of things that qualify as work in this context, sure. But it's not just humans who do this. As subtly included in a previous video, and pointed out in the comments, squirrels arguably sacrifice today to make sure that they can get through the winter. 
I know Peterson argued that somehow we're different from animals because they are just living according to the dictates of their nature, or whatever the phrase was, but aren't we too? Just because we've abstracted it from being out in nature fending for ourselves doesn't mean that we aren't still abiding by the same drives. Back to Adam and Eve, again. Peterson says that needing to work to survive isn't the only hard truth our archetypal parents got. They also got the good and evil DLC. It took me decades to understand what that means, to understand even part of what that means. It's this. Once you become consciously aware that you, yourself, are vulnerable, you understand the nature of human vulnerability in general. You understand what it's like to be fearful, and angry, and resentful, and bitter. You understand what pain means. And once you truly understand such feelings in yourself, and how they're produced, you understand how to produce them in others. It is in this manner that the self-conscious beings that we are become voluntarily and exquisitely capable of tormenting others. We see the consequences of this new knowledge manifest themselves when we meet Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve. I don't think this is what Peterson was intending with this paragraph, but it made me think of the impact of a parent's death when the child is still at home. As I've mentioned elsewhere, my dad died unexpectedly when I was 16. I don't know what it's like to lose a parent as an adult, but as a teenager, it definitely shifted my priorities. It's part of why I was okay going and being a trailing spouse instead of trying to salvage my academic career. Life is too short, and you could lose anybody close to you at any point. I could ramble on about that for a while, so I'm gonna cut myself off here. But I bring it up because my dad's death did give me a really quick lesson on how vulnerable we all are. And I'm disgusted that Peterson thinks that this vulnerability knowledge would only be used to inflict suffering on others. To be unfiltered for a moment, this is terribly in character with the rest of the book. Of course this knowledge would only be used for negative, harmful purposes. It couldn't be used to promote empathy or positive things. The focus of this text has been on how awful and fallen we are, with brief nods towards improving ourselves either at the end of the chapter or just in the rule names. And I would think a self-help book would benefit from focusing on the positive instead of focusing on the negative, but I guess this is how Peterson thinks people need to hear the advice to improve? Eh. It would be less of a slog if he did it the other way, though. By the time of Cain and Abel's appearance, mankind has learned to make sacrifices to God. On altars of stone, designed for that purpose, a communal ritual is performed. The immolation of something valuable, a choice animal or portion thereof, and its transformation through fire to the smoke to the spirit that rises to heaven above. We're going to be charitable here and take this first part to mean that by the time the Cain and Abel story was formalized, sacrifice was already happening. And of course, Peterson is talking about just one variant of sacrifice as if it's representative of all types of sacrifice. As mentioned in part one, there's many different types of sacrifice and not all of it involved burning the offering. In some types of sacrifice, the offering is eaten by the community doing the sacrifice. Anyways... Cain and Abel sacrificed with varying degrees of success. Cain's sacrificial rejection was a more painful rejection because he tried. If he had just not done it, Peterson says it would have put a limit on his outrage. Surely he's experienced students who didn't do anything all semester and goofed off, but are now uppity and upset about their grade? They have no self-aware limiter on their indignation. Because Cain is now out the time and effort of producing the sacrifice as well as the benefits of doing it, Peterson says, Under such conditions, the world darkens and the soul rebels. Peterson describes Cain and God's argument and says it was a poor decision on Cain's part. God says that not only is the blame 100% on Cain, but that Cain has knowingly and creatively dallied with sin. He included a reference for this statement that I want to spend a moment on. The reference is to a website I've mentioned before as it's Peterson's go-to for Bible stuff. Just the way he talks about it in this reference struck me as needing hashtag not sponsored. And I call Peterson distractible. Whoops. So yeah, Cain and God are arguing. Cain blames God, God blames Cain, 
and tells him that he's getting everything he deserves consequence wise. And Peterson says that Kane was actually looking for an apology, and since he got told off instead, now he wants revenge. Kane defies the creator audaciously. It's daring. Kane knows how to hurt. He's self conscious after all, and has become even more so in his suffering and shame. So, he murders Abel in cold blood. He kills his brother, his own ideal, as Abel is everything Cain wishes to be. He commits this most terrible of crimes to spite himself, all of mankind, and God himself all at once. He does it to wreak havoc and gain his vengeance. He does it to register his fundamental opposition to existence, to protest the intolerable vagaries of being itself. Recall, dear viewer, that self-conscious in this Peterson context is a side effect of eating the forbidden fruit. I think it was in Rule 2. Maybe this is some extended universe sort of lore, but in the copy of the Bible that we've got, Adam and Eve have Cain on one line, Abel in the next, sacrifices from the two in the next two lines, Cain's offering wasn't good enough in the next, then the argument. Nowhere in here do I see anything about Cain idolizing his younger brother. And yeah, we're talking about the motivations of a fictional character here, so who holds a valid interpretation of it depends on who you ask. But it hardly seems like Cain killing Abel was an existential protest, like Peterson has repeatedly claimed. This reminds me of a line that popped up at one point on the Monty Python TV show. Murder is only an extroverted suicide. For a little meta-humor, it comes from a criminologist talking about an absurdly violent criminal, and saying what a lucky bastard that guy is for doing what so many of us wish we could. Given the time devoted to nefarious persons in Rule 6, and the strong, courageous words Peterson used to describe these people, that this quote came to mind seems only fitting. Then there's some business about Cain's lineage and things, his offspring and their offspring, offspring, and their offspring, offspring, offspring. His father. His father's father. His father's father's father. His father's 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 father. His father said and did before Peterson says that the ordering of the Bible, meaning Genesis being followed by the flood story, is no accident. You think? I would be surprised if any holy book's ordering was done without some intent. Evil enters the world with self-consciousness. The toil with which God curses Adam, that's bad enough. The trouble in childbirth with which Eve is burdened and her consequent dependence on her husband are no trivial matters either. They are indicative of the implicit and oft agonizing tragedies of insufficiency, privation, brute necessity, and subjugation to illness and death that simultaneously define and plague existence. Their mere factual reality is sometimes sufficient to turn even a courageous person against life. But human evil adds a whole new dimension of misery to the world. It is for this reason that the rise of self-consciousness and its attendant realization of mortality and knowledge of good and evil is presented in the early chapters of Genesis, and in the vast tradition that surrounds them, as a cataclysm of cosmic magnitude. Okay, sure. The Judeo-Christian creation story tries to explain why life is difficult. But I'm not going to buy this argument that humans are the only ones capable of doing evil. But this is an argument we've been over before, and I don't want to rehash it here. And Peterson's talking about courageously offing oneself again. Given the last section and the veneration he gave to Socrates' death, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Peterson says that people being awful to each other could be worse than tragedy. And he talks about one client's experience with a bad relationship that left her with PTSD. The point of this anecdote was to highlight that the actions that we do to each other, specifically the negative ones, can really mess with us. So now Peterson wants to know the motivations behind being shitty to each other. And he says that life itself isn't evil. I can agree with that. But the hard lot of life, magnified by the consequence of continually rejected sacrifices, however poorly conceptualized, however half-heartedly executed, that will bend and twist people into the truly monstrous forms who then begin, consciously, to work evil. Who then begin to generate for themselves and others little besides pain and suffering, and who do it for the sake of that pain and suffering. In that manner, a truly vicious cycle takes hold. Begrudging sacrifice, half-heartedly undertaken, rejection of that sacrifice by God or by reality, 
take your pick. Angry resentment generated by that rejection, descent into bitterness and the desire for revenge. Sacrifice undertaken even more begrudgingly or refused altogether. And it's hell itself that serves as the destination place of that downward spiral. It always comes back to the bitter, angry, resentful cookies of doom, I swear. If I really wanted to torture myself when I was done with 12 rules, I would go back through and compile a list of all of these doom spirals Peterson talks about. I wish he would clarify what he means by sacrifice here. The literal meaning of it is pretty easy given how he's just talked about Cain and his sacrifice, but what does this doom spiral look like in somebody that you care for or even in yourself? And what can we do to help ourselves or others out of that spiral? There's a piece of folk advice that fits here. Never ascribe to malice that which can be explained due to stupidity or incompetence. Not everybody who's trying to fuck you over is doing it out of malicious intent. Some people are just blithely unaware of the effect that they have on others. Sure, some people may be actively trying to do you harm, but it's not healthy to assume that everybody is. It seems like Peterson's trying to get his readers to be hyper-vigilant about other people wronging them and their own faults and misdeeds. Then we wrap up this section with some more style madness driven repetition of these ideas, finally getting back to the central theme of this chapter. How do we sacrifice to reduce suffering, but now also sacrifice to reduce evil? And then there's a part that feels like a non sequitur. The story of Cain and Abel is one manifestation of the archetypal tale of the hostile brothers, hero, and adversary. The two elements of the individual human psyche, one aimed up at the good and the other down at hell itself. Abel is a hero, true, but a hero who is ultimately defeated by Cain. Abel could please God, a non-trivial and unlikely accomplishment, but he could not overcome human evil. For this reason, Abel is archetypally incomplete. Perhaps he was naive, although a vengeful brother can be inconceivably treacherous and subtle, like the snake in Genesis 3.1. But excuses, even reasons, even understandable reasons don't matter, not in the final analysis. So much Jung in this quote. Just lay it out in the open. Although, do remember that we're not supposed to be questioning stuff at this point. Final analysis sounds so ominous. I assume this is when we're having our heart weighed against a feather to see if we get devoured by Amut or not? Oh, wait. Gotta be in the right mindset. St. Peter at the gates? I had been warned that Peterson gets less subtle huh, about the undertones of Christianity in the book as it goes on. You ready for him to jump that shark? The problem of evil remained unsolved even by the divinely acceptable sacrifices of Abel. It took thousands of additional years for humanity to come up with anything else resembling a solution. The same issue emerges again, in its culminating form, in the story of Christ and his temptation by Satan. But this time, it's expressed more comprehensively, and the hero wins. You heard right. The problem of evil was solved by Jesus. Standardized test analogy time. Jesus, being tempted by the devil in the desert, is to Cain being blank. If you're Peterson, the answer goes something like, long quote time. I do try to distill this stuff, but sometimes you just gotta suck off the madness to eat for yourself. The Jesus devil desert temptation story is the story of Cain, restated abstractly. Cain is neither content nor happy, as we have seen. He's working hard, or so he thinks, but God is not pleased. Meanwhile, Abel is, by all appearances, dancing his way through life. His crops flourish, women love him. Worst of all, he's a genuinely good man. Everyone knows it. He deserves his good fortune. All the more reason to envy and hate him. Things do not progress well for Cain by contrast, and he broods on his misfortune like a vulture on an egg. He strives in his misery to give birth to something hellish and in doing so, enters the desert wilderness of his own mind. He obsesses over his ill fortune, his betrayal by God. He nourishes his resentment. He indulges in ever more elaborate fantasies of revenge, and as he does so, his arrogance grows to Luciferian proportions. I'm ill-used and oppressed, he thinks. 
This is a stupid bloody planet. As far as I'm concerned, it can go to hell. And with that, Cain encounters Satan in the wilderness, for all intents and purposes, and falls prey to his temptations. Cain turns to evil to obtain what good denied him, and he does it voluntarily, self-consciously, and with malice aforethought. Okay, here's something that the more biblically literate can chime in on. I've heard, I think it was Hannah and Jake, Bible Reloaded, that Cain and Abel represent the divide between agrarian versus herding societies and the agricultural revolution. However, I've also heard that the problem was that Cain's sacrifice wasn't heartfelt. The relevant passages from the Bible, working from the King James Version, are in Genesis 4, right? Where in this is anything Peterson is talking about? It says that Cain brought produce as his offering, Abel brought animal offerings, and God preferred the lion diet options. Maybe what Peterson is going on about is in some apologetics I just haven't been exposed to, or it's in his own special flair in interpreting this stuff. My read on Cain's actions was that he made the best offering he could given what he was working with, tilling the ground. God wasn't pleased, and so Cain, in a fit of passionate anger, killed his brother. You want a blood sacrifice, God? Here you go. Google's been getting a bit of a workout for this passage. So I quickly looked to see if there was anything out there about parallels between Jesus and Cain, but the things that return are about the parallels between Abel and Jesus, not Cain. Basically, this interpretation that Cain deciding to kill Abel is actually Cain abstractly being tempted by Satan, and that's later distilled into Jesus being tempted by Satan, seems like a bit of a stretch. If you recall, dear viewer, in Rule 6, we talked about the just world belief or phenomenon. If you don't recall, the just world belief is a cognitive bias where we basically tend to think that people get what they deserve. An aspect of this is that if bad things are happening to someone, they must have done something to deserve it. An unfortunate example is for assault survivors. They couldn't have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time, they must have done something to warrant the attack. Baked into this is the idea that bad things won't happen to us, because we are good people. Peterson saying that Abel deserved his good fortune just smacks of the just world belief here, with the flip of it being that Cain deserved his bad fortune. So up to this point, had there been a death in the Bible before Abel? I know that this is like the first murder, but was this also the first death? Did Cain somehow understand the consequences of his actions when he did this in the story? If he did somehow understand the consequences, ignore this comment, but if he didn't understand the consequences, how can it be said that he did this with malice aforethought? Coming back to a recurring problem many have with the Bible, either the biblical God is omnipotent, omniscient, omni-whatever, and Abel being killed by Cain was part of his plan, or God was surprised by Cain's actions and is therefore limited in his scope. But that is a complete tangent from Peterson in this book, so we'll leave that there and move on. Peterson says that Christ went a different way than Cain did when tempted, and that Jesus' desert trip is what we all experience in our darkest periods when black nihilism beckons. And let us suggest, in testament to the exactitude of the story, 40 days and nights starving alone in the wilderness might take you exactly to that place. It is in such a manner that the objective and subjective worlds come crashing synchronistically together. 40 days is a deeply symbolic period of time, echoing the 40 years the Israelites spent wandering in the desert after escaping the tyranny of Pharaoh and Egypt. 40 days is a long time in the underworld of dark assumptions, confusion, and fear. Long enough to journey to the very center, which is hell itself. A journey there to see the sights can be undertaken by anyone. Anyone, that is, who is willing to take the evil of self and man with sufficient seriousness. The exactitude of the story has me once again questioning how literally Peterson's reading the Bible. I remember, again, Hannah and Jake, Bible Reloaded, them saying that 40 days and nights was just an expression of a period of time. Sort of like how we throw around millions or billions or gazillions or whatever as to convey a large number. So I don't think it's necessarily symbolic of a period of time so much as just a figure of speech that's fallen out of usage and understanding. I feel like I've developed an ear for Freudian or Jungian speech that's worked itself into Peterson's writing. 
Synchronicity is originally a Jungian concept that roughly means that there are no real coincidences. If there's a coincidence, there's meaning behind that relationship. So Peterson's inclusion of that term is to indicate exactly what he spells out for the readers because the target audience would likely not have caught the intended meaning behind its inclusion. And I would lose my atheist card if I didn't mention that we don't really have evidence for the ancient Jews being enslaved by the Egyptians. Final thing before moving on. I thought to visit the underworld you had to be lying down and say, descend soon. But you can't stay there too long lest you turn to dust at daybreak. Peterson says that the visit to hell can be accomplished by thinking about the horrors of the concentration camps in World War II. In the grim wake of the last ten decades of the previous millennium, the terrible destructiveness of man has become a problem whose seriousness self-evidently dwarfs the problem of unredeemed suffering. And neither one of those problems is going to be solved in the absence of a solution to the other. This is where the idea of Christ taking on the sins of mankind as if they were his own becomes key, opening the door to deep understanding of the desert encounter with the devil himself. Homo sum humani nihil ami alienum puto, said the Roman playwright Terence, nothing human is alien to me. This unredeemed suffering and intertwining of that suffering with destruction is foreshadowing on Peterson's part. Although switching between the last century's problems, Jesus as Redeemer, and a line from a Roman play doesn't really mesh for me. Speaking of, Peterson doesn't provide the full translation of that line. The full translation is, I am human, and I think nothing human is alien to me. Apparently, Terence's work saw a lot of rotation during the Middle Ages and Renaissance, as it was relatively easy Latin to learn from. This line comes from a play, the summary of which reads like a soap opera, a bunch of relationship drama and subterfuge. I had heard that line used in a Jesus vs. Devil context elsewhere, but I couldn't say where, unfortunately. Maybe it was Jesus Christ Superstar? I don't know. But anyway, my understanding of that line was that Jesus was basically saying in a roundabout way that he recognized that the person he was talking to wasn't a person. From stuff we'll talk about in a few, Peterson is using this to say that Jesus understands and is taking on all of humanity's behaviors, and thoughts. The time has finally come for Peterson to explicitly whip out his Jung. No tree can grow to heaven, adds the ever-terrifying Carl Gustav Jung, psychoanalyst extraordinaire, unless its roots reach down to hell. There is no possibility for movement upward, in that great psychiatrist's deeply considered opinion, without a corresponding move down. It is for this reason that enlightenment is so rare. Who is willing to do that? Do you really want to meet who's in charge at the very bottom of the most wicked thoughts? What did... I'm not saying his name. Mass murderer of the Columbine High School writes so incomprehensibly the very day prior to massacring his classmates. It's interesting when I'm in my human form knowing I'm going to die. Everything has a touch of triviality to it. Who would dare explain such a missive? Or worse, explain it away. Why does anything good have to be rooted in bad? I don't understand this self-flagellating mindset. Maybe it ties back into the just world belief, in a way. Somebody who has paid their dues, done their penance, deserves favor from the universe. And this belief is sort of baked into the Abrahamic religions. You need to lay yourself open in front of God, bury your soul and your sins in order to be forgiven. Back to the quote. What does Peterson mean by enlightenment here? We're back to using loaded words without really clarifying their intended meaning. The proximity to Jung could indicate he's talking about one of the goals or stages for Jung. By goal, I mean individuation, which is the goal of therapy. Get a person to untangle all their unconscious issues, and they'll be able to function as a whole person. Or in the stage sense, Jung's final stage of development was the spiritual stage in which a person forms a connection to their spiritual self and the truth that the physical world is only temporary. This would sort of line up with a more Buddhist interpretation of enlightenment as well, but I'm getting a little tired of doing Peterson's job for him. Since he asked, yes. If there are beings in charge of all of this, I would be interested in meeting them. Both of them. All of them. If anything, God has a lot more to answer for than Satan. Didn't Peterson try to explain the Columbine shooter's mindsets in The Last Rule, along with the other mass doers of harm? Or is the implication here that Peterson is the daring one to incorporate those things in his book? 
Peterson says that the metaphorical and psychological meaning of Jesus having this encounter with desert Satan is that Jesus is taking personal responsibility for all of humanity's shittiness. Jesus is the one to look our darker nature in the eye and do something, presumably. This is nothing merely abstract, although it is abstract. Nothing to be brushed over. It's no merely intellectual manner. It seems like a dose of hipster slash stoner Peterson. It's this thing, but it's not this thing. Don't use your brain to think about it, man. Squirrel! Exact quote because we're going to dig in here. Soldiers who develop post-traumatic stress disorder frequently develop it not because of something they saw, but because of something they did. Before talking about his references, let's take a quick aside for post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Broadly speaking, PTSD is a severely negative reaction, frequently repeated reaction, to a stressful or traumatic event. The current version of the DSM moved PTSD from being an anxiety disorder to being a trauma and stressor-related disorder. The requirements for diagnosis are the person having been exposed to a stressor, which could be something that could have caused their death or severe harm. This could be directly or indirectly experienced. Indirect exposure includes things that are experienced as a first responder or hearing about the traumatic experience of a loved one. Intrusions of the traumatic event. This can be memories insisting you think about them, nightmares, flashbacks, and or general emotional or physical problems. Avoidance of trauma-related stuff. These can be thoughts or feelings associated with the trauma or external things that trigger memories of that trauma. Negative shifts in the way the affected person thinks or feels. This can resemble depression or result in an inflated sense of who is responsible for the trauma. Difficult changes in arousal and reactivity. This can have some overlap with depression symptoms, as a person may have problems concentrating or sleeping, but they may also be hypervigilant for new threats or triggers, have a heightened startle response, be irritable, aggressive, or self-destructive. For diagnosis, the symptoms must have been going on for at least a month and be disrupting the person's normal functioning. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this elsewhere, but it doesn't hurt repeating. There's variability for who will develop PTSD in response to traumatic events. What will kick off PTSD for one person will just be a bad traumatic event for another. Also, the traumatic event doesn't have to be a life or death situation. It can be a milder traumatic event. Peterson's reference 136 is actually pointing to two papers. The first is a paper by Shapiro and others and is unfortunately out of my reach. From what I do have available in the abstract, the authors were working with the hypothesis that participation in war zone atrocities would be significantly related to long-standing dissociative symptomology among Vietnam veterans with combat-related PTSD. Why this was their hypothesis, I can't say. They found that those who participated in atrocities were more likely to dissociate down the road. If you aren't familiar, dissociation means roughly disconnecting from reality in some way. It does tend to show up in PTSD, but the exact way it manifests varies between people. So, from the available information, this reference does support the claim that Peterson's making. That veterans who develop PTSD do so because of things they did while fighting. The second reference is also about Vietnam vets. The author's goal was to try and tease apart the different war stressors veterans could have meaning exposure to combat up through committing atrocities, and the impact on the later PTSD and or depression symptoms. Participants were Vietnam War vets who were actively seeking psychiatric help. Lots of standardized tests were used to establish PTSD, depression, and combat exposure, so yay there. An unpublished atrocity scale was used, but given how infrequent the need for one of these scales is, I'll let it slide. Especially since they included information about its reliability. A low score on this atrocity scale indicates no experience of atrocities, while a high score means the person was an active participant in all atrocities. The relevant finding for Peterson's claim is that more severe PTSD and depression was found in those who had higher scores on the atrocity scale, which is in line with Peterson's claim, so we aren't in a dissolving lobster brain scenario here at least. What sent me digging is that both of these references have populations that experience their trauma in the Vietnam War, 
and I think it's fair to say that it was an ugly war. But the nature of the U.S.'s fighting, and specifically what the soldiers experience as that fighting, has changed since then. And I honestly had to sit here and think a bit about what point I was trying to make in doing this digging. And I think it basically boils down to war veterans developing PTSD for a number of reasons. For some, it is what they did, like Peterson says. But for others, it's things that were done to them either by the enemy forces or by friendly forces. So his claim or his research that veterans are developing PTSD because of atrocities they committed, it implies that every person who's a war veteran that you meet with PTSD, they participated in some atrocity. And that ain't it, Chief. So with that in mind, the rest of the quote. There are many demons, so to speak, on the battlefield. Involvement in warfare is something that can open a gateway to hell. Now and then something climbs through and possesses some naive farm boy from Iowa, and he turns monstrous. He does something terrible. He rapes and kills the women and massacres the infants of Mi Lai. And he watches himself do it. And some dark part of him enjoys it. And that is the part that is most unforgettable. And later, he will not know how to reconcile himself with the reality about himself and the world that was then revealed. Self-help in the 21st century. Here's something cute to cleanse your brain. Peterson says that the Egyptian god Horus experienced the same thing when going up against his uncle Set. There's also a comment about Horus being seen as a precursor to Christ with a citation. The two references in the citation are a book about the pagan Christ and maps of meaning. Natch. There's also a footnote about Set being the etymological precursor to Satan. Sadly, this is not explored further. To distill the point and boil off some of the style madness, in the myths, Set kills Osiris, Horus's dad. The goddess Isis, wife to Osiris and mom to Horus, tells Horus to protect the Egyptians from Set. Some fighting and intrigue later, Horus gets the throne of Egypt back from Set. In the struggle with his dread uncle, however, his consciousness is damaged. He loses an eye. This is despite his godly stature and his unparalleled capacity for vision. What would a mere man lose who attempted the same thing? But perhaps he might gain an internal vision and understanding something proportional to what he loses in perception of the outside world. That quote background is certainly getting used this rule. Holy shit. How is losing an eye damaging to the consciousness? I mean, yeah, you can't quite see the same way, but you can still see. Attempted what same thing? Fighting an Egyptian god? When you find one, we can set up like a special MMA match or something to figure it out. Until then, how about you be clearer in your writing, Peterson? Put the magic toad down when writing life advice. Satan embodies the refusal of sacrifice. He is arrogance incarnate, spite, deceit, and cruel, conscious malevolence. He is pure hatred of man, God, and being. I am not cutting out huge sections here. Paragraph-wise, it goes... It goes Jung, to Christ and Satan, to PTSD, to Egyptian gods, to Satan. Because devil gonna devil, Peterson says that it had to be the devil confronting Jesus, the archetype of good. <coughs> Peterson neglects to mention who made the archetype of evil in the first place. The rest of this section is a painfully long exploration of the three temptations of Christ. Let's see how far I can push this summary. Temptation 1. Satan tells Jesus to stop starving and make some bread out of rocks. Jesus says no. Peterson says that the lesson here is that Bread is of little use to the man who has betrayed his soul, even if he is currently starving. Peterson counters potential naysaying, like it's all well and good for someone who's not starving to say these things, by referring back to Solzhenitsyn and his gulag experiences. Breaking from the hard summary, I'm including this verbatim because... you'll see. 
Christ aims, therefore, at something higher, at the description of a mode of being that would finally and forever solve the problem of hunger. If we all chose, instead of expedience, to dine on the word of God, that would require each and every person to live and produce and sacrifice and speak and share in a manner that would permanently render the privation of hunger a thing of the past. Live as the archetypal savior lives, and you and those around you will hunger no more. Surely, the way to solve the world's hunger problems is to get everybody Christian. That'll fix it. Temptation 2. Yeet thyself off that cliff. Prove you're the son of God. Peterson says that Jesus knows that God can't be provoked into doing magic tricks. But of course, this has deeper significance. Jesus refuses to demand that God prove his existence. He refuses, as well, to solve the problems of mortal vulnerability in a merely personal manner by compelling God to save him, because that would not solve the problem for everyone else for all time. Okay, of course, why not? Temptation 3. His place is top lobster. But Peterson warns that being at the top of the dominance hierarchy, not being facetious, he seriously includes that, comes with the temptations of feeding our darkest desires and natures. Grant Cain enough power and he will not only kill Abel, he will torture him first, imaginatively and endlessly. Then, and only then, will he kill him. Then he will come after everyone else. Me saying this book was sometimes an unintentional autobiography for Peterson started off as a joke. At this point, it's a concerning warning about the stuff that's floating around his head. He's getting an awful lot out of this story. Metatextually, on that last comment, Peterson goes on to describe a vision he had at some point. The context for how or why or when or what he was doing when he had this vision is not provided. Peterson got into the chaos snakes again. In this vision, he was flying and there were huge glass pyramids everywhere. People were trying to get to the tops of the pyramids. But from his perspective, he could see that pure, detached attention was chilling above the pyramids, waiting for... something. But then without further discussion of what the fuck the point was of talking about that vision, we're back to Tempti Numero Tres. There is a powerful call to proper being in the story of the third temptation. To obtain the greatest possible prize, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, the resurrection of paradise. The individual must conduct his or her life in a manner that requires the rejection of immediate gratification, of natural and perverse desires alike, no matter how powerfully and convincingly and realistically those are offered, and dispense as well with the temptations of evil. So I spent 10-ish years as a university student at various levels, and another couple years as an adjunct. And I never so much as caught wind of a professor talking about the kingdom of God on earth in any sense. This is probably different for schools where they have a religious program of some form, but in the sciences, that sort of talk would get you laughed out of whatever classroom you were teaching in. What the fuck? Reject natural desires, again with the culty language. Finally, for this video... Peterson wraps up this section with an intriguing transition into the next. Sacrifice of the more prosaic sort can keep that tragedy at bay, more or less successfully. But it takes a special kind of sacrifice to defeat evil. It is the description of that special sacrifice that has preoccupied the Christian, and more than Christian, imagination for centuries. Why has it not had the desired effect? Why do we remain unconvinced that there is no better plan than lifting our eyes skyward, aiming at the good, and sacrificing everything to that ambition? Have we merely failed to understand, or have we fallen, willfully or otherwise, off the path? Quick responses, because let's wrap this video up. What's meant by sacrifice, especially a prosaic one? Because it's just a story, my dude. Sacrificing everything to a sky daddy who isn't real? Mayhaps we be unconvinced because it's just a story? Or, maybe, just maybe, it's none of that because it's just a fucking story. Stay tuned, dear viewer. This shit gets even weirder in the following sections, believe it or not. Like, throwing shade at an unnamed Christian group, or totally the Catholics, in a self-help book, levels of weird.